Rosenbaum, a botanist, native plant grower, and certified ecological restoration practitioner. He's a founding partner at Wild Ridge Plants, LLC, a business that grows local ecotype native plants using sustainable practices and performs botanical surveys. Jared is also the author of the book, Wild Plant Culture, a guide to restoring native edible and medicinal plant communities, as well as a children's book, which is really cute, called The Puddle Garden, all about native plants and wildlife. He's also a musician and plays guitar in the band Hollow Howl, which makes this introduction really special to me because my band Flat Waves actually played a gig with Hollow Howl last July, hopefully more to come. Um, so my music world and my plant world are colliding tonight. And I even have my Hollow Howl t-shirt on, which y'all should pick up and check out his band on all the social medias out there. Um, so yeah, without further ado, Jared, take it away. Thanks so much, Tara. And thanks everybody at the Native Plant Society for hosting me. Appreciate you all joining me tonight. I'm glad none of us had to drive anywhere, or I'm assuming none of us had to drive anywhere in this cold to be here. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So bear with me for just a moment, please. All right. You should see a title screen that says Wild Plant Culture and has a couple other details on it. You know, somebody holler at me and we're going to get started. Looks good. So about a decade ago, someone wrote a book about the island where I grew up. And they describe 30 species of native orchids, glacial bogs, giant tulip tree forests along its sloping shores. And this remembrance of my childhood island brought a little tear to my eye because, excuse me, the island where I grew up is Manhattan, and the natural habitats described in the book were from over 400 years ago. And that book, by the way, is Manhattan. There's a little image of it in the corner of the screen. Really amazing book. Those of us who are naturalists, are interested in the natural world, have a tendency to look to the past with sadness because... I think we have this yearning for how nice it was before, well, before people messed it up. So this picture here, kind of uh, appropriately sepia toned, is actually contemporary. And it's from Joyce Kilmer, Memor excuse me, Joyce Kilmer Memorial Forest uh, down in the Smokies, a really fantastic place to visit if you haven't been there yet. And it's an old growth forest. And, you know, in many ways, old growth means to us something like, and before Europeans or before European invasion or before the white man came or something along those lines. Um, and it's kind of before people messed it up. The thing is, there were people then too. Here, we're back in Manhattan or Manhattan, if you will. This is an artist's rendering of a Lenape camp near what is now Wall Street. And the conventional view about indigenous peoples that has remained is that they were primarily in small scattered bands of people with little to no impact on the environment. However, much recent scholarship points in the direction that populations of indigenous peoples were much higher throughout the Americas than ever conceived or understood before in recent history. It's now clear that indigenous peoples existed in large populations and complex societies throughout, throughout the Americas. So how are we to square this new information about high populations with the persistence of extraordinary diversity 
alongside these large human populations. And what about new information coming from other places? So some places like the prairie, that beautiful millions of acre sort of wildflower and wild grass garden that existed throughout the middle of this continent are now becoming understood as the result of a partnership between people and fire and buffalo and plants. And even the Amazon, which for so long has sort of served as this archetype of like the virginal vast wilderness, you know, untamed by humans. There's so much really interesting cultural ecology, archeology span coming out of the Amazon, showing and LIDAR imagery, showing incredible societies, civilizations, um, and we look critically back at some even early accounts of explorers from there, it is clear that so much of what was understood to be small populations of scattered bands of people actually was a result of post-contact conditions, especially epidemic disease. And so here's just a little snapshot on that Amazon work. As a working field botanist, I don't think that my job is just creating a list of plants. I mean, that is my job, don't get me wrong. I go out into natural areas, usually parks, nature preserves, and so on, and I create a list of the plants that are there. But I feel that my role is to interpret the story of a site by listening to what the plants are communicating, by their presence, by their absence, by their health. Are they flowering? Are they fruiting? And to reconcile that with what I understand about the land use history of the site. When I wander around in natural areas in much of New Jersey, including locally here in sort of north central westish New Jersey, where I am, Hunterdon County, Warren County, I see these places and I know that they were beautiful. And often I'll see a little trace of it. But, you know, as a botanist, it's my job to tell the story of places. And I have to admit, I'm tired of telling the same story again and again, of excessive deer brows, invasive species, lack of a shrub understory, lack of herbaceous plant diversity. I know that in these places, there are plant and animal species missing. And I feel that the animal species that is most often missing is us. We tend to think of most human involvement as negative. You know, cue the bulldozers and herbicides and interstates and suburban development and everything else and huge mega malls. The list goes on. But as we move into an era of ecological restoration, and it is the UN decade on ecosystem restoration, can we tell a story that is different about human involvement? Can we tell a story that is older, deeper? Can we look to other cultures and places and times for an understanding of how to live differently with the natural world? Maybe for a colonel to answer that question, if there are so many people in the Americas, how did they interact with what we think of as the wild or natural landscape in such a way that supported and maintained biodiversity? And I would say that as we consider restoration, ecological restoration is a young art. It is a young art, it is a young science, but land management is an ancient practice on this continent. One that I think those of us involved in restoring ecology in some way or another should be looking at to better understand how humans can interact with all the other beings around us and one thing that's clear to me is that land management on this continent was always internet with cultural plants, with edible plant species, with medicinal plant species, with species for crafts and building and ceremony and so on. So 
what would it look like if we saw people in relationship with wild plants? What would it look like if we saw an American, a distinctly American practice of land management, of creating cultural landscapes that both supported large populations of people and also supported biodiversity. And I think that this may be what the Americas really have to offer to the world in some ways. This book up here, Tending the Wild by MCAT Anderson, this was a big influence on me. I encountered it, I don't know, a decade or so ago, maybe a bit more at this point. And it really got me thinking about the Northeast where I live. Her book is based around uh, what is now known as California. Um, and it's based around indigenous land management practices in California. And one of the things that Kat Anderson ends up saying is that those landscapes in California, those vast prairies and beautiful like old oak groves and everything else, that in some cases naturalists like John Muir like talked about in such beautiful poetic terms as these kind of like chapels of virginal nature and, you know, what have you, they were not recognized for what they were, which was in fact cultural landscapes, the outcome of sophisticated and complex harvesting and management practices. And so Kat Anderson talks about practices related to maintaining and increasing native plant abundance, coppicing, pruning, harrowing, sowing, weeding, most especially the use of controlled fire, but seed sowing and plant dispersal, digging and thinning, all ways in which they altered the structures of plant communities for abundance, for more food, for more medicine, but at the same time created and maintained distinct habitats that in the absence of that human presence have declined. And I'm not in California, but you hear about the decline of ancient oak, oak groves. You hear about the impacts of fire now because the land hasn't been maintained in the way that it was by indigenous peoples. So to bring this a little bit closer to home, there's this fantastic book uh, from up in Maine by Carrie Hardy, Notes on a Lost Flute. And Carrie's this really interesting person, um, still very much active. And he follows, among other things, the trails of these kind of linguistic artifacts in the landscape. So he looks at place names up in Maine and he translates them into their original indigenous meanings and seeks to understand more about the landscape through the names of plants and, and uh, practices around harvesting and fishing and so on. It's a fantastic book. And one of the things that Kerry does is he talks about this pro um, he talks about this, um, excuse me, this uh, land management practice that the Algonquins turned Minasagi. I don't know the correct pronunciation. Um, and it's literally to tend the land, uh, to burn the understory. And Hardy talks about these fire maintained landscapes full of strawberries, raspberries, and choke cherries, artichokes. He talks about out of range, so sort of dischunked from the core of their native range, edible native plant species like Jerusalem artichoke and burr oaks that he is finding remnant groves of that are the remains of cultural landscapes, food landscapes, food forests, if you will, maintained by indigenous peoples of Maine. One more book for you. Uh, I imagine some of you may be familiar with this book. This is a really beautiful book uh, about native plants by Robin Kimmerer. And one of the things she does um, is she talks about this plant sweetgrass, which is a native grass species. I've never seen this in the wild. It is used for basketry and ceremonially. It's very important among many indigenous peoples up and down the East Coast. And it's also a disappearing plant species. Um, and she and her graduate students work on a number of projects around the distribution of sweetgrass. And one of the things that they discover is that when they look at a map of the distribution of this plant, the places where it still exists 
are clustered around indigenous communities, particularly those known for their sweetgrass basket tree. And the conclusion they draw is basically sweetgrass thrives where it is used and disappears elsewhere. And this really flies in the face, I think, of a lot of our um, dominant narrative about the wild, or nature, or old growth, or you know, kind of like virginal nature and all these kind of tropes that we've inherited. Because what Sweetgrass is saying is that I actually do better when there are people harvesting and there's human activity. And then when people leave, when we go to occupy our bubbles of technology and subsist from a monoculture agriculture, sweetgrass leaves also. And I don't believe that sweetgrass is the only plant that misses its animal partner, that misses us and its relationship with human beings. Talking about relationships. So here's like this classic optical, uh, excuse me, optical illusion. I think many of you might recognize it. Uh, we either see on the, on the outsides, like these two faces, or on the inside, a goblet or a chalice, or, you know, throw up in the chat if you've got some other idea of what's in the center there. And I would say that if I was to use this optical illusion kind of as a, a visual metaphor, that so much of our Western thought is focused on those two individuals rather than on the relationship between them. And that much of our science has been about dissecting and categorizing those individual parts, taxonomizing, taking things apart, atomizing, so to speak. And ecology may be radical because it reorients us towards relationships, towards that goblet instead. Let me give you a native plant example instead of an old optical illusion. So here we have hummingbird. Excuse me, is there a little animation? No, there isn't. There's something here, but um, hummingbird, ruby-throated hummingbird and cardinal flower. And so we have this beautiful native wildflower with these long red tubular corollas and a little nectar reward at the base of that floral tube. And then we have hummingbird here and she has her head like all the way right up in there and her bill deep in cardinal flower seeking that nectar reward and those of us who feed hummingbirds we might know what do they like they like sugar water that's sort of what's in the base of lubelia cardinalis there and if you look closely you can see look how closely those forms are matched to each other hummingbird and cardinal flower these are two species that have evolved together over deep time and as a matter of fact, as cardinal flower is providing hummingbird with a nectar reward, cardinal flower is also depositing a little bit of pollen on the back of hummingbird's head, right where cardinal flower's anthers touch uh, the back of ruby-throated hummingbird's head there. And so one is feeding the other, the other is helping the other affect reproduction. And people talk a lot about the importance of native plants. And sometimes we give a time-based definition, like these are plants that were on this continent before 1492 or whatever. And sometimes we talk geographic or political boundaries, but this is what native plants are really about. This is why they're important. It's these deep time relationships between plants, soils, climate, water, geology, the soil biome, pollinators, seed dispersers. It's these deep time relationships that make a plant native and make them part of a community. And you know what? I mean, don't get me wrong. Hummingbird is a really beautiful bird. Although as a city kid, the first time I ever saw a hummingbird, man, they scared the out of me. Um, so what is this giant flying insect? But that's an aside. And cardinal flower is also really beautiful, but without each other, they're also kind of weird. They're sort of grotesque, uh, you know, maybe sort of monstrous. Like, why does cardinal flower have these crazy big red tubular corollas, if not for hummingbird? 
without ecological context, without relationships, individual species can become monstrous and grotesque. That is what has happened to us. We don't have our relationships anymore. One sort of niche way that we seek relationship, something that I'm involved in that has been very meaningful to me is foraging. And I think many people who forage are seeking a connection. And it's this great way to go out on a trail and immerse and you're finding food and there's sort of a treasure hunt. And maybe there's even just like a little bit of our sort of like uh, our, our consumer training kicks in and I'm like, ooh, I'm getting all this stuff and it's for free. and we're connecting with plants. We're looking for connection as foragers, but is it relationship? I think foraging is relationship if we can offer something back. We have a really big population. We have a really big learning curve to relearn skills of wild harvesting and so on. And what can we give back? I think what we can, can give back is what people have been giving back to plants for so many millennia, which is stewardship, tending, management, working with plants at a community level to encourage biodiversity and plants thriving. Uh, a little side anecdote. So that jar you see in the center, I made lacto-fermented milkweed top pickles once. I was really proud of myself. I put it on social media back then. It must have been Facebook. Um, snore. Sorry, snarky. Um, and I was patting myself on the back. And somebody who I really like in the, you know, sort of naturalist community said, oh, you know, you're eating um, milkweed. Or I said, I'm eating milkweed. And she said, well, I would prefer to leave my milkweed for the monarch butterflies. I said, ouch. And so I've been talking about it in every presentation ever since just to prove why I was actually right. So let's talk milkweed for a second. Um, milkweed is this amazing native perennial vegetable. And I will footnote that right away by saying a lot of people consider milkweed to be toxic. If you're going to eat it, do your own research, reach your own comfort level on it. I know what I do in terms of preparing it. And many foods, including the foods that we eat, you know, from the supermarket, need preparation in order to be healthful and so on. Milkweed has like a shoot phase when it's first coming up in spring, it's kind of like asparagus. Those lacto-fermented pickles, those are from what I would liken to the broccoli phase. Those are those flowers before they've actually opened up. So flower buds, just like broccoli. And then actually has an okra phase when it has soft, tender seed pods. <coughs> excuse me so milkweed has this very long harvesting arc probably a lot longer than most of our annual vegetables and quite exemplary for a perennial vegetable as well and what i would say is yes monarch caterpillars rely on milkweed and what if all of us who plant kale or tomatoes or basil, also planted common milkweed because it was this amazing vegetable. I think there would be that much more milkweed for the monarchs. And not only that, monarch butterflies are these incredible creatures. You know, they sort of briefly cross, you know, fly across our, our screen, as it were, um, especially during the fall migration. They're so stunning. Imagine if we ate milkweed and they ate milkweed, we would have this connection. We would be breaking bread with the monarchs. So we have vast areas of land that could support more intact relationships. And they include lawns, you know, the amount of lawn we have is somewhere around the amount of land we have in national parks, urban areas, farms, parks, beautiful stream sides, but so degraded. And if we are going to restore degraded habitats to have more of the relationships that underpin ecology, 
I would submit that we should be using intact habitats as a model to understand the potential of these degraded places. And that brings me to a concept from the practice of ecological restoration that really speaks to me. And it's this idea of the reference ecosystem. Sometimes it's called the reference site or the reference community. But what we're talking about here is a place where you can go and learn and see a more intact community or assemblage and bring that information home to wherever you are attending. Maybe you're a volunteer at a local nature preserve. Maybe you're a land steward, a farmer. Maybe you have a suburban lot with a front yard and you are figuring out, hey, as our gardens grow to become something like small ecological restorations, many of us native plant gardeners are matching plants to the existing conditions in our land because we want these plants to thrive long-term. So arguably in a garden, we could create specialized conditions for each of the plants we want to grow. You know, have a little limestone rock garden for our columbines, or slightly different conditions for our gentians and a little rain feature here for some wetlands plants. Um, and, you know, like really high fertility for that Joe pie weed and so on and so on. And as a gardeners, it, it as gardeners, it's our potential and, you know, it's a gift to be able to do that. But as we think about restoring the larger and larger areas of land, I think we think more about matching plants to the existing conditions. What are the soils like here? How much rainfall do we get? Is this a well-drained soil or does it retain water after rainfall? Is it acidic or am I on a high calcium rock type? And to create long lasting restorations that fit the land we're working with, we need to consider the habitat and utilize appropriate plants. And one of the ways we can do that is we can visit natural areas in our region and look for reference ecosystems. So one of the reasons I really like this idea of a reference community or reference ecosystem is because I think of restoration as both a science and an art and I think that there is a lot that can be collected in the field in terms of quantitative information. So we can make lists, we can make spreadsheets, we can gather data about sites and make species lists and so on and so forth. But there's so much that I think our human senses allow us to perceive when we go someplace natural that is really hard to translate into a spreadsheet. And I think we sort of absorb this almost by a process of just um, pure observation or osmosis as we're in natural areas. And we can see, you know, where does the sun travel through the day? And how is that reflected in the ground layer? You know, at this time of day, when there's a little bit of a canopy gap, or as we move closer to the stream, what happens to the leaf litter on like, you know, the higher, steeper banks versus the lower one? And which bend of the stream is the skunk cabbage in and which bend of the stream is the Christmas fern up on and so on. It would be extremely hard and gratuitous to try to represent that in spreadsheet form. And yet this is what we as human animals are so good at. Art, drama, theater, I think it all comes out of our imitative potential, something that some people call mimesis, and when I go to like a bookstore, and I'm a nonfiction author, I go to the fiction shelves and I'm just awestruck, like how did people create these books, these fiction books that so capture what human life and emotion is like that you can read it and you can feel like this really happened, but somebody just made it up. And I think this is our imitative capacity. This is the artfulness at the core of being human at work. And I think as restoration practitioners, we have the potential to do something really similar, which is to visit these places, visit these reference sites, observe, take it all in, and then translate and recreate on the canvas of our yard or our park or a degraded stream side or our urban gardens. So if we're gonna talk about intact, native habitats. And we're gonna talk about cultural plant species and these deep time relationships that we, the human animal, have with plants that have sustained us over time. What does an intact native habitat look like? 
what food plants does it contain? So a couple of years ago, well, more than a couple, we went on a little family reunion to the Endless Mountains in Pennsylvania, beautiful area. And I was currently obsessing about Monarda didyma bee balm. So I'll, you know, gets fixated on a plant and I'll want to know like, where in the wild does this grow? I mean, this is a plant we grow in our nursery. Um, we cultivate on our land. I want to understand who does it grow with? What kind of soils does it grow in and so on? And I knew that here in New Jersey, Monarda didyma bee balm, that beautiful crimson wildflower is considered to be, um, it was on, uh, considered to be state endangered very rare and while it is sometimes a remnant in old homesteads or travels from people's gardens those populations that were understood to be wild spontaneous populations really just concentrated up in the northwest corner of new jersey and i wanted to go to a place where there was more monarda didyma and see what it looked like and i knew that as i moved into the more high elevation and appalachian portions of pennsylvania i was going to find more bee bombs so we snooped around a bunch, and one place that we visited was Dyberry Creek. And this was this beautiful stream corridor with some really exceptional forest plants along its shaded banks, trilliums, purple fringed orchid, and wild leeks and blue cohosh and so on. And then these beautifully like, um, sun dappled cobbly shores where there weren't trees that were like these wet meadows with joe pie weed and tall cone flower and bone set cardinal flower and bee balm liked it sort of right in between you know there's a picture there with bee balm poking out from some ostrich fern um you know kind of liked it nice and, and moist and fertile and maybe a little bit shady or but a bit more sunny than your trilliums and so on and I took note, and I also took uh, a little plant list, you know, just because I thought I might write a blog entry or something about it. This wasn't by any means a comprehensive plant list of all of Dyberry Creek or even the entire site, but it was just like, who's Bee Bomb and who are Bee Bomb's neighbors? Excuse me. <laughs> um, and so here's that list. If we isolate out just the edible and medicinal native plant species, and I would say, just the choice edible and medicinals, because in fact, you know, red maple you can tap for sugar, and alder is used by herbalists, and big leaf aster has edible, edible foliage, and so on and so forth. But I'm picking, you know, some particularly good stuff here. You get the following species, and it'll take a little bit of time going through some of these. I'd love to get in deep with edible and medicinal uses, um, but I suppose if you're interested in that, you can check out the book. Um, and I will say before getting into any of this that one, if you are interested in edible or medicinal species, please check your identification through multiple sources and also verify what I'm telling you through multiple sources. Oftentimes it's a matter of degree or preparation or so on. So don't just say, oh, well, Jared told me that, you know, blah, 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 and go out and eat it. All right, disclaimer aside. So wild leeks, some people know them as ramps. Uh, they're this like very prized gourmet wild onion now. You see them in high-end restaurants and urban farmers markets and so on. And they're not very fast growing and they're becoming depleted from their natural areas. Common milkweed, we already talked about a little bit. Yellow birch um, has wintergreen in it and has xylitol. So if you use health food store toothpaste, it might have wintergreen and xylitol in it already, but guess what? You can chew on a yellow birch twig and get the exact same stuff. It also makes a delicious tea. Blue cohosh is a medicinal primarily used in birthing. Bone set is a medicinal primarily used for flus, viral infections. Virginia water leaf is an early season cooked green. Wood nettle is probably my favorite cooked green. I think wild or not, it's so nutritive and meaty. And if I was a vegetarian or whatever, I would eat even more wood nettle. But I'm not, and we'll get to that. Um, ostrich fern, if you have eaten fern fiddleheads, you probably should have been eating ostrich fern. So these are, you know, again, sort of like a gourmet item popping up in restaurants and a traditional kind of New England food item. Here's our friend Bee Balm. Uh, many of you probably grow bee balm because it's such a beautiful native plant. It also has red tubular corollas. 
And guess what? It's also hummingbird pollinated. It's co-evolved. It actually branched off from the rest of the genus Monarda to specialize in hummingbirds 400 million years ago. That's what I'm talking about, native plants. This makes a delicious, soothing tea. And you can actually harvest those same um, petals, if you were, the same flower parts that the hummingbirds like. And they have a little bit of rose and a little bit of citrus and some sweetness. And they're a really delicious nibble. Talcone flour, first cooked green of the year, very important food item on Cherokee, other indigenous peoples. Common elderberry has become much more uh, common of an item, so many people know of it as a syrup. Basswood is all salad greens for about a week when its foliage is young. Hemlock, not the hemlock that Socrates drank, but our northern um, hemlock tree just reminds me of the north woods. It's just beautiful aromatic tea. And great nettle uh, subspecies gracilis is our native subspecies of stinging nettle, which is um, fairly well known as this really highly nutritive green and supportive herb. So, all right. Now you know some of the things that you can go to a riparian or riverside or streamside area and harvest, but how can we give back? If we see ourselves in relation to this habitat, what can we offer it? And I would say a couple of things. One is so many of our bottomlands, our stream corridors, our riversides and so on are heavily disturbed first by European agricultural conversion, by hydrological changes, by industry, which is often uh, along rivers. These areas are ripe for restoration. They still often have very fertile soils, the sun, moisture, uh, if we talk about those wild leeks for a second, the ramps, these are plants that a lot of people harvest and a lot of people don't give back. But if you harvest in the spring and maybe you harvest foliage instead of the bulbs, which is lethal, you can go back in October and harvest the seeds. And wild leeks have these little black seeds. They're round, they're shiny, they're like little BBs. And the way wild leeks disperse is they roll off the plant and they maybe roll downhill a little bit. And that's kind of it. Birds aren't picking them up and moving them miles away. Um, you know, the wind isn't blowing them around like milkweed wishies. But we, with our transportation smarts and our ability to go in and harvest and disperse, we can go back to that ramps patch that we were harvesting from and harvest seeds and disperse them. And guess what? Even though wild leeks tends to occupy high quality native habitats and doesn't seem to cross borders very quickly. So if you've got like an old forest and then a golf course and then Route 95 and then a suburban development and then this young forest that used to be agriculture 50 years ago, it's going to take a really long time for ramps to get over there unless we help it. So one of the things we can do is we can augment with plants by bringing seeds, bringing plants. We can do weeding. What if you do have an ostrich fern plant, um, patch along the river and every spring you go there with your kids and you harvest some fiddleheads and um, you see that there's some garlic mustard coming in or there's some mugwort coming in or there's some Japanese knotweed coming in. Well, maybe you have a relationship to this spot. Maybe say, wait a minute, this is where my family has been going for generations and generations to harvest ostrich fern. And we're gonna make sure that this remains good habitat for ostrich fern and for Virginia water leaf and bloodroot and trout lily and everything else that is around it. And the last thing I'll say about riverine riparian habitats is that so much of the tending that we can do for this place is actually has to do with what we do upstream because these places are victim to our tendency to treat water like garbage, shed it off the roof as quick as possible, get it out of the yard as quick as possible, get it off the road as quick as possible, get it into sewage, sewers and drainages and retention areas, and ultimately into streams and rivers in the ocean as this hot, salty, garbage strewn, chemical laden, waste product and this is the water and so by being native plant gardeners by putting perennial plants where there were lawns or no plants 
We slow water before it even hits the ground. We provide spongy, healthy soils for it to soak into because what we want to do with water is slow and spread and infiltrate it into the ground and reduce our flooding impact on all these stream and other habitats. Lest we think that delicious, amazing, edible native plants only are found in these highly fertile bottomlands, I want to take you to the opposite end of the spectrum. Pyramid Mountain is a place that I did botanical survey work back in maybe 2017 or so. It has this high glacially scoured ridge line of resistant billion year old rock. There's an overlook there that you used to be able to see the Twin Towers from. You can still see a bit of the New York City skyline. And it has these uh, felsic sort of acidic, th poor, thin soils. And this wonderful plant community, this is not just edibles, but it's just a little snapshot of what was there. Uh, we'll be taking questions and answers at the end, by the way, I see a, a raised hand. Um, and you can put that into the Q&A section below there. Um, unless there's something going wrong here. Um, and so if we look at Pyramid Mountain, this little bit of like nice, uh, nice the rock ridge line that the glaciers came in they stripped all the topsoil off of and has very slowly regenerated since then and we do the same thing and we look at the choice edible species there we find serviceberry amylanchor arborea which you can't really get in the supermarket has such a delicious fruit sort of the size and the look of a blueberry but in the rose family, a little bit apple a little bit cherry-like, a little bit of almond flavor. We have black chokeberry, which is less tasty for fresh eating, but is incredibly rich in antioxidants and vitamins, makes a great juice. We have black birch, just like yellow birch, tea, toothbrush syrup. Black huckleberry, if you like blueberries, you'll like black huckleberries. You may have even harvested them and known it or not known it. I find them a little bit sweeter. They have a little bit of a seedy crunch that doesn't sound that appealing, but I love it. And I like them even better than blueberries. And that's saying a lot. Bristly dewberry is one of these uh, kind of um, trailing blackberry species. Lowbush blueberry. Indian cucumber root really tastes like cucumber, but it's a fatal harvest. So I only tried it after years and years and years of seeing it very limited in New Jersey. We were up in the smoky somewhere and there were like thousands. And it tastes like a cucumber. Salmon seal. So we talked about how milkweed, when it's tender or shoot first coming in the ground, kind of like an asparagus, very analogous. So salmon seal is another native asparagus. So sweet, so crispy, so delicious. And can I say it? It's like asparagus without the asparagus, you know, that kind of weird smell. So um, especially the giant Solomon seal makes this incredible perennial vegetable. What I mean by that is it comes back year after year. You don't have to reseed and replant the garden every year. It's just there. Black cherry, black cherry syrup, black cherry soda. You can eat the fruit. Sassafras, I'll get back to oaks. If you like root beer, you should dig up a sassafras root at some point and at least smell it. Amazing. It smells like root beer. It's kind of an incredible experience. Viburnum, one of the last fruits of the year. And, excuse me again, <clears throat> oaks. So, I would say that one of the underpinnings of our food culture is annual grains, uh, maybe even the underpinnings of Western agriculture. Grains like wheat, rye and barley and god corn everywhere the corn and these are all again annuals so they require tillage they require repeated land disturbance and they provide us with starches well oaks also provide us with starches through flour derived from their acorns there are many cultures in the world which do or have subsisted in part on acorn flour it's more nutritive 
It has high quality oils in it. And it's not that hard to process. It's a wonder to me with all the machines that you can buy everywhere that you can't just buy some desktop machine to toss your acorns in and get acorn flour out the other end. But meanwhile, we kind of homebrew distill it and it's delicious added to pancakes and waffles and muffins and everything else and makes them much more nutritive. If we think about what can we offer back to these ridges, like travel with me up to this ridge line. The soils are really thin. Sometimes there's just like a covering of moss. The leaf litter has blown off in the winds of the winter. The trees are kind of bonsai and eccentric looking and they're widely spaced. And if you look at where they're rooted, they found a little crack in the bedrock and they've rooted down on in. And so they're widely spaced and there's often a lot of sun hitting the forest floor. Unlike the closed canopy forest, further down the slope, you have an open sort of orchard-like condition, a glade, if you will. And these are cupped open partially by the thin soils, by the exposed bedrock, by the harsh conditions, and also historically and in many places are kept open either by wildfire, not so much in the Northeast, or by cultural fire, fire set by indigenous peoples. And one of the things that we can offer back to these habitats is to keep them open, to keep their species composition, to keep them in native fire adapted plant species is to reintroduce fire to ridges, to glades, to the upper slopes of hills and mountains. We can also keep some of that sub shrub, that low shrub, that herbaceous diversity by coppicing and thinning the trees and keep those widespreading oaks and hickories and fruit trees orchard fashion the way that maybe California indigenous people would have. We can augment with seeds. It's not a great place to plant in very thin soils where the granite and the nice rock will be 130 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer. And maybe through our harvesting, we can even expose a little bit of soil because a little bit of disturbance here spurs native annuals, your Venus looking glass and so on, your pennyroyal, and, um, and keeps a little bit of flux in areas where sometimes those heathy shrubs, your black huckleberries, your low bush blueberries can become very colonial and dominant. So these are places richest in diversity when ample sun reaches the ground and we can help to perpetuate those conditions, those open prairie shrubland glade conditions in places like these. I wanna leave you with some before and after pictures from a restoration project that I did, which was on a farm where they had had a conifer plantation and a blue down in Superstorm Sandy. And we restored it as part of a restoration project um, with native species, especially tilted towards an edible plant palette that was gonna complement the farm production. And I wanna leave you with these before and after pictures and also with one last anecdote. And this is a story about our pine barrens here in New Jersey. Well, not really. It's a story about returning from the pine barrens. So I have a friend, colleague, someone who I've worked with on a couple of documentary video projects. Um, and his name is Jared also, so it's confusing. And, uh, you know, our primary, I think, shared interest has to do with the environment and ecology. And my friend, I hope you won't mind me talking about him in this slide, but he's one of these people who really follows the news and he's always up on the latest statistics and so on. And so our conversation tends to gravitate towards uh, environmental issues. And I'm very different from him. I have long ago reached my threshold of bad news about the environment. I see it every day when I'm out doing field work and I get overwhelmed. I don't wanna hear anymore. And I think we traumatize each other and our children when our environmental discourse comes down to just telling people tragic facts. And I think we shut people down, which is not to say that people don't need to know the truth about the environment, but it is to say that there needs to be something else. And I'm going to get to that something else, but let me tell you about my conversation with my friend Jared. So we're driving back 
from the Pine Barrens, he and I, and we're talking and he's telling me one of these facts, like, you know, scientists estimate that, I don't know, 50 to 70% of the world's diversity will be lost in the next century or, you know, something else that just like is absolutely crippling to hear. And he's going on about stuff like this and I'm starting to get irritable. And at one point we're leaving the Pine Barrens, we're passing by a little residential area and some woodlots and I roll down the window and I'm like, Hey, Jared, uh, other Jared, I'm the real Jared. He's the other Jared. Um, I said, yeah, look out the window at that woodlot over there. You see the woods over there? Those woods already lost 50 to 70% of uh, their biodiversity. Do you think anybody who lives here noticed? Do you think anybody cares? Do you think anybody gives up? They don't unless they have a reason to care. They don't unless they have a connection. They don't unless they have a relationship with that woodlock. And we humans, we need to overcome this great forgetting that we are wildlife, that we are embedded in natural habitats, that we interact with ecology. We need to find our habitat again, we need to find our relationships again. We're an animal species too. And in sundering ourselves from the wild world, we've done ourselves a disservice and the rest of nature as well. Thank you so much for your time listening to me tonight. If you're interested in these topics, restoring native plant communities, thinking about cultural plant species, about indigenous land management. All this is based around my book, Plant Culture. I encourage you to check it out. If you want to be in touch about plants, I love talking about plants, you can reach me. There's my email address. You can check us out at wildridgeplants.com. Find me on Instagram, whatever it is. And thanks so much for your time tonight. And I have time to answer some questions. Jared, thank you so much for that presentation. I think that this kind of subject matter is really important in kind of like shifting the tone of the conversation around native plants. And I, I was taking notes as you were talking and I kind of got a little taste of this vibe when I read Braiding Sweetgrass a few years ago, but you just like blew it up and um, really brought a lot of soul to the science, which I think is really important. And for us to remember our relationships and our place in the environment as well. So I just thought that was super awesome. And I can't wait to watch the recording again um, when when we have it up on our YouTube. But I before I get into the Q&A, I have to make a disclaimer. Hold on. I have it on my phone. Um, that NPS and J does not endorse wild harvesting of native plants, nor do we endorse eating native plants without scientific references and safe preparation of the plants or their parts. I had to throw that in there. Um, but we can get to the Q&A now. Um, we had a number of people ask about what were you gathering in the gathering baskets in your slides? Yeah, so the one gathering basket when I was talking about foraging, that's all American hazelnut. So still in its husks and American hazelnut, Coralus americana. It's very much like the hazelnut or filberts that you will buy in the store, but it is a native species. We actually have two Coralus species here, beaked hazelnut and American hazel. They're both edible. Um, I would say that American hazelnut comes out on top in terms of harvestability for some sort of technical reasons, but that was a basket full of hazelnuts from shrubs that we have here at Wild Ridge, just planted on our farm that we seed collect for our nursery for. And we also have a ton of surplus and we've made hazelnut flour cake. And we actually have this grinding machine that will uh, shell all the hazelnuts and just kind of spit them out. And it's pretty cool. Awesome. Let's see. The next question is um, from someone, Hillary. Um, thinking about doing a burn on a third of an acre, um, as their asters and goldenrod are overpowering, but, um, they're scared about harming 
the bumblebees and any other insects that are there. So do you have any advice for doing like a, a controlled burn? So ultimately I'm not the right person to go in depth on this topic. I've done a fair amount of field work in burn areas and being a keen observer of them, but I'm not a burn practitioner myself. But often what we do when we talk about meadow management is we're talking about things like burning or more commonly mowing in order to maintain the dominance of wildflowers and grasses as opposed to woody plants. And so we are potentially interfering with certain parts of invertebrate life cycles. We're generally not burning during the growing season when bumblebees are out and flying and so on, but there are insect species that overwinter in herbaceous material and so on. And oftentimes when we do meadow management, there's this trade-off between if we don't have the meadow anymore because we haven't maintained it, there won't be habitat for all of these beings that rely on meadows. And at the same time, our management is by its very nature a disturbance and can either be fatal or disturbing to a variety of species. And so sometimes we'll mow just half of the meadow. And you know, if you are gonna burn, maybe you'll partition your meadow so that there's always a you know, uh, a sort of reservoir, if you will, of unburned area to repopulate the burned areas. And if you are in New Jersey, there is a bunch of encouraging you legislation and provisions for allowing private landowners to burn and there's a permitting process and you can actually get permission and limited liability and you need to you know, walk through appropriate steps in order to do that. Fabulous. Next question is from Russ Cohen. Um, he says, great talk. <laughs> uh, do you consider deer berry edible? Um, he says, I don't recall seeing it in your book, but I've seen it in the New Jersey Highlands. Um, I eat deer berry. And uh, I didn't realize it was edible. And then I found out it was edible and I really ate a lot of it. And I had a little tummy ache after that. And <laughs> I, I don't think, I think it was just because of my gluttonous eating of it. Uh, I certainly enjoy some of those other berry, those other ericaceous plants like black huckleberry and low bush blueberry. And so I guess if I had to advise somebody, I'd say one, look it up elsewhere. And two, take it slow when you're trying a new wild edible, you know, take a bite come back next day, you didn't have any adverse reaction, have a little bit more, um, and don't just pound deer berry the very first time you realize that it's edible. Another question about um, an edible uh, yes. uh, is from Betty Ann Kelly. Isn't sassafras tea carcinogenic? I don't know. Yeah, so this is an item of controversy. Um, at one point, the FDA said that we can't have natural root beers anymore because sassafras contains saffron and under some preparations, you know, saffron can be extracted and it's shown to be a carcinogen when you uh, feed massive amounts of it to rats. And a lot of people in the sort of, you know, natural food and herbal community said, this is a traditional food item that's been consumed by people for millennia. And the experimental design is flawed because nobody eats as much as they're packing these poor rats in. And the artificial sodas that are root beer now, because you can't make it out of sassafras, probably also carcinogens also. And certainly if you, you know, drink a box of Miller Lite, you know, good luck with that too. So it's one of these things where, yeah, an isolated chemical constituent at high volumes had carcinogenity. And so now you can't market sassafras as like an herb or as a food. I don't believe there's anything against you making your own root beer every once in a while. But like many other things I talk about, I encourage you to go out and do your own research. And everybody has a different tolerance and threshold for trying new things, trying new food. Some people think Indian food is weird. Some people think broccoli is gross or kale or whatever. And some people don't want to mess with potentially carcinogenic or toxic plants. I get it. One of the cool things about toxic native plants is it makes all of us better botanists. So when we go out and we become <laughs> foragers, we really have to pay attention to what we're harvesting and we got to do our research. And um, so I appreciate what those plants bring to the dialogue. Um, but I don't want to give the impression that the world is full of highly toxic plants that are this huge threat. And I don't personally think of sassafras as much of a threat. Cool. Um, this is from Jan. 
How do you suggest dealing with deer when restoring an area? Yeah, so I've been talking about wild edibles and I've been very remiss because I haven't talked about the most ethical food item that you can possibly consume right now, which is venison. Uh, yeah, even you vegetarians and vegans. No, just kidding, right? Maybe kidding. Um, it's, you know, free range and humanely raised and sort of organic, depending on what they're eating and all of that. And here is a species that is out of balance with the remaining natural community. So yeah, deer are beautiful and they're charismatic and they're wild and they're free and so on. But the more deer, the less chickadees and the less blood root and the less monarchs and the less, well, I guess milkweed's sort of deer resistant. Um, but the less so many other beings there are. And, you know, guess who the primary predator of deer were before, you know, let's just say the last couple of centuries. The primary predator of deer were not wolves, which are now absent from the Northeast, or mountain lions, which are absent from the Northeast. But um, the primary predator of deer was us. And this is one of the important roles we played as keystone animals in our ecosystem was we kept this very fertile, quickly reproducing, um, very effective herbivore in check. And the plant people loved us for that, and they'll love us again to the extent that we can encourage deer management and hunting. But pragmatically speaking, our native plant projects, our ecological restoration projects, will often succeed or fail based on our ability to keep deer away. And I really advocate in all situations where it's possible, when we are bringing a habitat back to life, we need deer fencing. It's a cost and expense, it's built in, and it's real. And if you see a deer fenced area and you see what the native plants can do by themselves when they're there and they're not being hammered by deer, if you see bloodroot that doesn't look like this little diminutive flower, but looks like freaking cabbage, it's an amazing to see, thing to see, to see all these plants moving on their own, growing, seed dispersing, doing what they have always done before deer became so massively overpopulated. All right, off the soapbox, but that's my deer shtick for the day. <laughs> yeah, I think Mount Cuba Center is completely surrounded by deer fencing or something. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I mean, which it's, yeah, and you can definitely see the results of that if you ever visit Mount Cuba Center, which I love. Um, this is a good question um, because I think about this all the time, especially living just outside of Philadelphia. Um, this is another question from Russ. Um, do you have an opinion about gorilla planting, like planting seeds without the knowledge of the landowner or maybe like tossing seeds into like a vacant lot, that sort of thing? I mean, you know, it sounds really romantic and cool. And, you know, I'm a punk rocker, so I'm into gorilla stuff and, and you know, Yep, <laughs> um, I, I don't really know the answer to this question. Um, some of the questions that I would ask are, is it enough to just throw seed someplace? Is it the right seed in the right place? Are the conditions um, a, like ready or prepared? When we do ecological restoration, oftentimes we do site preparation, and that's something that has to be done before we even introduce plant material, and it can be weeding, can be working with the soils, and so on. And so, yeah, we can all toss um, wild bergamot and bottle brush grass and these aggressive, in the best possible way, generalist native plant species into vacant lots and so on. Um, and also, and I know Russ knows this, um, and, and and thank you for feeding me this cool question, but we're talking about a long-term relationship here. We're talking about tending. We're talking about really being part of that community. And if we're uh, gorilla fashion, maybe we have less opportunity to do that, which is not to negate the validity of that, but to say what would be even better is if we find ways to be invited onto all those vacant lots or find ways to work with our townships to manage our roadsides or our power line right of ways or all these marginal lands that we could throw seed bombs at 
and maybe something would happen, but they really need our presence. They need that missing animal back and they need us as caretakers. Gotcha. Yeah, it makes total sense. Um, this is a question from Phaedra, um, and it has to do with reference sites you mentioned. Um, she would love to know if there are any areas in the Piedmont that could be used as reference sites. It seems like most of New Jersey doesn't really have any reference sites left. The Piedmont has very little primary forest left. It's something like five to seven percent. So forest, not necessarily old growth that was never cut, but areas that haven't been converted to agriculture and then reverted back. And most of that is concentrated in New Jersey along the trap rock uh, ridge, ridge areas. So um, the basalt and the Wachungs and the diabase and the Sourlands. I would encourage people who haven't visited the Sourland Mountain area to visit that area as uh, a reservoir of beauty and natural diversity in the Piedmont, probably one of the more significant areas of diversity in the Piedmont, all up and down, because the Piedmont was easily converted into agricultural use. And that, that, played, that was my teacher. You know, I was a city kid, and then I moved to the Sourlands late in life, and uh, that's where I learned my plants, and I still have a, a place in my heart for the Sourland Mountains of New Jersey. But, you know, it's disturbed and it's deer browsed, and um, and we have to be aware of that when we check out the, those places. But still, um, there's some county preserves, Mercer County, Hunterdon County, um, Somerset County. They all have park systems in the Sourlands, as do other nonprofits and so on. And it's a beautiful place to start. And I do talk a little bit in my book about um, finding reference communities in your areas and reading your own landscape and comparing it and so on. And that may be something you want to tune into, or maybe I ought to do a a freebie blog entry or a talk about that at some point, because that's near and dear for me. It's like, you know, we're gardeners, and this is something I talk about with some of the Native Plant Society folks, you know, we're gardeners and we can talk a lot about landscape design and garden design and so on. And we, um, I think, benefit from seeing these plants that are beautiful in our garden, like your Joe Pye weeds and your cardinal flowers, we benefit from seeing them in the wild and seeing where they really like to grow and just seeing like, it's just the kind of like the sheer um like wild life in that and and i think it offers a kind of connection and also um you know when we bring a plant back to our garden we'll know where to put it and then if we put a plant in our garden the next time we go to a wild area and we see a familiar face from our garden it's like this wild area is more like home it's less like this distant wild thing and it's more like oh there's spice bush or there's bee bomb or there's wild bergamot or whatever, and they're part of my home, and so is this place. And I'm all about those um, community connections. Absolutely. I think we're going to st start, to, we're going to do a couple more questions. Um, I'm going to see what we have going on in the Q&A. Um, Maybe get to, there's some people that are just looking for some practical advice, like what um, if you would suggest if you have any suggestions for someone with a really, really wet bog like yard, that's really hard to um, get things to grow in with very wet clay soil um, to kind of slow down water seepage. Yeah, so um, I'm sorry, I lost a little bit of the thread of that, but recommendations for plants to hold soil and and against erosion especially in the face of um, really wet soil storms and stuff like that that we've been having yeah i do have a couple of thoughts of it right off the bat and i think it's just a beginning but um you know many of us gravitate towards beautiful wildflowers understandably so but some of the building blocks of wild habitats are our graminoids so our native sedges our native grasses these are species that we grow in the nursery and I get to see what their root systems look like. And sometimes we'll have a seed flat of sedges and it's been in there for a while. We haven't separated them out. And I can actually turn that flat upside down and it falls out as one chunk and it looks like a welcome mat. What am I saying here? <laughs> they have these incredible fibrous root systems that internet. And unlike some herbaceous plant species that have roots that are more like noodles and rely on mycorrhizal fungi for their fine feeders and others that have other architecture, the sedges and grasses have these incredible woven roots 
that not only do they hold the soil in this incredible way, but they have very rapid turnover. So they're kind of dying and regenerating and dying and regenerating. And what that means is incredible soil building capacity. And when you're building organic matter in soil, you're building aeration, you're building the soil biome. So all those creatures that live in the soil and ultimately by building aeration, by creating larger soil particles, because it's being bound by uh, bacteria and fungi, you are creating a soil that can infiltrate more water. So let me back this up for a second. We have compacted, degraded soils that have had equipment on them. They've had agriculture on them. They have plows or cattle or human foot traffic or cars or trucks or whatever. And they've lost their porosity. And so when rain hits them, the rain hits the top and it sheet flows off of the soil. If there's no vegetation there, the rain really hits the soil hard. It brings up, to the extent that it disturbs the soil, it brings up silts, which float in the water. And then when the water does settle back down, the silts clog any remaining pores, and we get an even more like unaerated soil. And what plants do, and what soil biology does, is it actually binds soil into new soil aggregates. Between the soil aggregates, we have areas for air and water to flow, and soil becomes spongy. So when we native plant garden, when we introduce perennials to degraded landscapes and soils, we are restoring those soils. So not only does rain not hit and sheet flow with no obstruction, like it would on a driveway or on like a lawn in the winter or what you know and lawns are pretty marginal in terms of this but we'll have foliage to intercept and those sedges and grasses actually have this vase like growth form where they'll like take water and they'll channel it down into their root systems and they'll do the same thing with like dew in the summer during drought so they're aerating the soil they're adding organic matter and it's all part of this again relationship this big cycle that engenders more abundance, more health, more biodiversity, better health downstream. And this is a part of, of a cycle that we were all part of before, you know, indigenous land management and so on. And by being native plant gardeners and ecological restorationists, we are re-embedding ourselves in this cycle as caretakers and as healers, not just as, uh, you know, a gardeners, as something much larger. This is another practical question, um, which I'm also curious about because um, I I live in a very, I live right outside of Philly and in Coll well Collingswood, New Jersey, and um, there's that strip that's between the the street and the sidewalk, you know. Um, and somebody here asked Mark Gotworth asked, um, what are some small trees to grow and plant on a New Jersey property that won't get taller than 20 feet? And that kind of dovetails with my concern right now of getting a kind of a smallish tree that I can plant in that in that area yeah. that would be good for the suburban ecosystem. Yeah, a couple of plants come to mind, and this is probably like a real random sampling of like what percolated to the top of my head at this exact moment. But one of the plants that comes to mind is bayberry. So this is a plant that grows in the New Jersey coastal plain. And I mention it because it's very salt tolerant. And as we can see right now, our roads are horrendously oversalted. So this is a consideration. Mm -hmm. It's also deer resistant. It's resistant to dry, but it can deal with compacted and clay soils. So a really tough customer. It does like sun. So I wouldn't put it in a really shady spot, yeah. but it doesn't sound like that's a primary issue. I also really like aronia, uh, black chokeberry. This has a beautiful kind of vase-like shape, nice fall color. Uh, it has fruits for the birds and for people. Uh, bayberry actually has interesting fruits too, but I suppose I don't have the time to go into that. And, and interesting foliage too from a tea and herb pr perspective. Um, but aronia melanocarpa, black chokeberry comes to mind. Um, maybe a little bit more dainty, but the amelanchers, the service berries, they're good street trees. They don't grow very large. Um, they have beautiful flowers in spring and good fruit uh, in you know, June, July. Um, so good for the birds, good for people, um, super ornamental. Does come to mind. Native roses, you know, we have got non-native multiflora rose everywhere, but we seldom now see Carolina rose, Virginia rose. Part of this is because of deer browse. I think they're a lot more common, but they're quite low. 
you know, Carolina rose tends to be a foot or two tall most times when I see it. And Virginia rose, Virginia rose can get a little bit taller, but it's also like you know, generally kind of like a waist high plant species. So if you need something kind of orderly and very beautiful, and hey, it's a rose, just happens to be native, that comes to mind too. And and there are so many others, and there are so many overlooked native shrubs, even like our American hazelnut, that we just don't talk about that often, that are fantastic plants. Awesome. I was taking notes there. 